You're listening to the Audacious Church Leadership Podcast. We know this will be an incredible resource for your life. So stay focused, listen up, and thanks for joining us. Welcome, everybody, to an Audacious Leadership Podcast. You are an extraordinary leader. And so this session is about helping you grow, uh, sharpen yourself, increase your capacity. And I'm looking forward to what we're going to do right now. My name's Paul Reed. I'm part of the team here at Audacious. And it is my privilege to lead us for a moment as we focus our thoughts and discuss about this subject, how to deal with conflict, how to deal with conflict. Um, Two key scriptures to set us up for this session. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12 says this, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says these words, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. There's two types of people or maybe two extremes when it comes to dealing with conflict. One end of the gauge, one end of the scale is those who avoid conflict at all costs, like a member of our crew was just telling me a moment ago. And you're the kind of people who perhaps, you know, just like a lady who was on a train with me uh, when we were allowed to be on public transport together, and uh, it was a packed train, and I rode the train all the way from Bolton to central Manchester, which is about a 20 minute train ride. And when I got to the stop where I was getting off, I looked down um, to pick up my bag and realized that I'd been standing on her foot for 20 minutes. And she obviously was a conflict avoider as she didn't say anything the whole time. And all she would need to do was just say, excuse me, sir, you just stood on my toe. But no, she avoided it at all costs. Maybe you're at that end of the spectrum or maybe you're at the other end of the spectrum and you are up for a fight always. And probably more than likely you're somewhere in the middle and kind of, you know, visit either end every now and again, depending on the mood and the circumstances. But No doubt, for a leader, you have to know how to deal with conflict. And the reason why is because of the words of Jesus in uh, John 16, 33, in which he says, in this world, you will have trouble. In other words, guys, there's going to be conflict. So as leaders, it's important for us to know how to deal with conflict because we're going to have it and also how to help others deal with it. Because many of you are not just leaders of others, but you're leaders of leaders of others. And so that means people are going to come to you, not just with their um, having conflict with you, but they're going to be trying to deal with conflict in the people that they're leading. And so I want you to listen to this session with that double application in mind. One application being how you as a person deal with conflict when it inevitably comes. But secondly, how you can help others in their dealing with conflict so that we can all become uh, masters of this uh, inevitable ingredient in all of our lives and leadership. Uh, Five things about conflict to kick us off. Number one, it's inevitable. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And you need to just know that conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised. Don't feel like a failure. Don't, uh, you know, expect it all to be plain sailing. If you were selling white goods or stationery or just doing something that involved you and inanimate objects, maybe you could avoid conflict. But as you are people who work with people, it is inevitable that you will have to deal with conflict. 
Second thing about conflict is don't worry because it's not all bad. Number one, it's inevitable, but it's not a big deal because it's not all bad. I think sometimes we have this notion that conflict is a bad thing, and that's why we avoid it uh, at all costs sometimes. But it isn't bad because number three about conflict is that it can serve a purpose. Think about, um, here's a few examples, a diamond is produced through pressure um, over time. Uh, a pearl is created through the irritation of a grain of sand. When things are, are welded or forged together, it's only in great heat that that happens, but it's not bad because it serves a purpose. There's something strong about something that's been forged or welded together that couldn't have happened in the normal temperature. It took the heat of the furnace to create that bond. And so therefore, we need to see conflict in the same way that it can produce diamonds, it can produce pearls, and it can produce, I don't know, the oil that comes from an olive after pressing and crushing is a good thing. So it can serve a purpose. Fourth thing about conflict is that it's powerful when it's viewed correctly. That's why we have a responsibility to have this conversation in this podcast right now, because if we view it correctly, we can access the diamonds, we can access the oil, we can get the good stuff from it instead of avoiding it or uh, using it as a, a force for bad, if you like. The fifth thing about conflict is that it is something to be mastered. This is almost like a skill, a leadership skill is learning to master conflict. Now, you don't master anything by just deciding that you want to be better at it. It takes time, it takes practice, and it takes failure to learn how to do it right. The definition of an expert in some cases is a person who's done it wrong so many times that the only option left is the right option. And that's the only way I ever qualify of being an expert in anything is that I've made a mistake so many times. And so conflict is something to manage. The verse that I started with in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, let me remind you, it says this, but you man of God flee from all this. And then it says, fight the good fight. The question we have is um, how do you know when it comes to conflict, what things are worth fighting over, he says to Timothy, he says, fight the good fight. And what things are worth, if you like, getting over? He says, flee from all this. In two verses, he's saying, flee from some things, but fight for some things. So in the context of conflict for us, the question is, how do we know what things are worth fighting over and what things are worth getting over? Well, I have come up with an algorithm to help you answer that question. It's not a real algorithm, but I want you to imagine like you go onto a website and you're searching for cheaper car insurance or you're searching for the best deal for your utilities. These websites use these algorithms where you put a few key ingredients in and then at the end of the process, it spits out an answer. You, you ask and answer certain questions, and it gives you the answer. Your best car insurance is this one because you're this age, you're, you drive this kind of car, so on and so forth. Well, here's my is it worth fighting over algorithm to help you in your leadership and also those that you're leading. Three key questions that form this algorithm that tells you the right thing, whether this is worth fighting over or getting over. First question, what's the prize? So if I win this conflict, what do I gain? Okay, what is gained by me winning this fight? So it might be that uh, you gain your idea gets used. That might be the prize, if you like. Or it might be um, you'll be able to say, I told you so. Or it might be that everyone will celebrate you and they'll say you were right all along. That's some examples of, of the prize. Uh, second question is what's the cost? So what is lost by you winning the fight? We know what's gained because what's gained is everyone uses your idea and you go home feeling like you're the man. 
Um, but what's the cost? So what do you lose by by winning this conflict? It might be that the rest of the team feel undervalued. It might be that you miss out on a really, really, really good idea that we perhaps didn't get to because we just went with the first one that came. And then the third question, this is the key one, is, is it worth it? So is the prize worth the cost? When you go shopping and you're looking for a good deal, what you do is you see something that you like, if you're like me, you see something that you like and you're like, I want that. Well, before I take it to the till, I'm just going to check the price because if the price doesn't match the, the prize, price and prize, then you're kind of going, well, I don't want to pay that much for that because it's not worth it. And this algorithm Remember, it's not really an algorithm, asterisk, not all algorithms are real in this podcast. Um, but it's really a process of thought that I want you to get into the habit of using. But this is especially good for when someone comes to you and they're in a conflict with maybe their family or some colleagues or some other team members. You can say to that person, hey, what's the prize? What happens if, we, if you win this conflict? Get them to think about that. And then you can say, okay, what do you lose? And then ask them the key question, is it worth it? Because the is it worth fighting for algorithm comes down to, is the cost worth the prize? And if it is, it's worth fighting over. And if it's not, it's worth getting over. That's trademarked at paulreedindustries.com. It's not really, I made that up, but there you go. Um, okay, so we know the algorithm. We know what, how we figure out if something's worth fighting over or getting over. What I want to do now is just highlight some causes of conflict. We already know that it's inevitable. We know it's not bad. We know it's something that can be used for good. And we know it's something we need to grow in. So perhaps if we knew the, the reason or the, um, the source, if you like, of the conflict, that would help us in answering those questions of what's the prize and, and um, what's the cost. So I've identified three things that are common causes of conflict that uh, are not specific to a certain age group or a certain type of person. But in my experience over the last 20 plus years of working with people, these three things come up again and again and again when it comes to conflict. Here's the first one. Conflict is caused by unspoken or unrealistic expectations. When you have um, unrealistic expectations, it breeds disappointment and kills gratitude. Okay, so if they're unrealistic, it breeds disappointment and kills gratitude because you're rarely grateful for something that you expect. What that means is in a leadership context, when you do something for the first time, everyone's really grateful. Um, but when you perform well over time, people stop encouraging you. And it's not because they're not grateful anymore. It's just because they begin to expect that you perform at that level. If you want to stay encouraged, then only be good every now and again. And then people will always say, yeah, you did well. If you're one of those people who are thinking, oh, no one ever encourages me anymore, then just take some encouragement from this. It's probably because people are now starting to expect that you do something great. So you're probably hitting the bullseye every time. So well done. But anyway, unrealistic expectations breeds disappointment. People can't necessarily um, live up to expectations if they're really high and it kills gratitude. But the other one is unspoken expectations. Sometimes it's not that it's unrealistic. It's just that a person didn't know. This happens a lot in the context of relationships. People uh, have two different sets of expectations, but as they've never been communicated, it breeds this frustration and it's kind of simmering under the surface and eventually gets to a conflict situation where it explodes and the other person is shocked, surprised, offended, but it's not because uh, of anything other than the fact that it just wasn't communicated. So before you get into a scrap, a tussle, a conflict with someone, just ask yourself the question, is this about unrealistic, unmet expectations, or is this about just uncommunicated? I don't know if that's the word, discommunicated, anti-undisestablishment communicated. Anyway, bad communication is my point. So that's the first cause, okay? And that can really help give context to conflict. Conflict's not that bad if you know where it's coming from because you can deal with the root and then the, uh, um, the fruit of conflict will sort itself out because the root has dealt with the problem. 
Second cause, common cause of conflict is uh, emotional mirroring, emotional mirroring. In our brains, we have these neurons. They're called mirror neurons. They have a much more scientific name than that. But to the lay person like you and I, they're called mirror neurons. And scientists tell us that what they do is they're designed to mirror what you see emotionally in another person. It's probably um, ex um, illustrated to the nth degree with a baby. When you see a baby, then what you do is you smile at them and you kind of, you know, have open body language and you make weird cooing sounds that are kind of like nice and soft and fun. And what a baby does is they mirror what you're doing. So you smile at them, they smile at you. You kind of go, oh, you could you put you put you, and they kind of do the same back. Your mirror neurons are kicking in and they're mirroring not just your body language, but the emotions that you're displaying get mirrored. Now that's a good thing if they're positive emotions. But what can happen is when it comes to conflict is that we mirror the negative emotions. So if someone's had a bad day or they're just in a bad mood and just, you know, give me a wave, metaphorically speaking, if you've ever had a bad day or been in a bad mood, everybody should be raising their hand right now. I see that hand. Um, because we all do it, but it's easy for us to be a bit sharp with someone, a bit loud, a bit, uh, you know, a bit cold maybe, or even rude. And what that does to the other person is nine times out of 10, we see their anger and it becomes like an emotional poker game where we go, oh, right, you're going to shout at me while well, I'm going to raise you by shouting even louder. And so we come back and say, what are you shouting at? And then that person is like, I'm in a, having a bad day here. This person's not being very understanding. I see your shout back. Now I'm going to slam my hand on the table and go three decibels even louder. I tell you what I'm shouting at. And there you go. It gets mirrored and goes round and round and round. And before it blows up into this big explosion, it's not really about the thing Often there isn't a thing and you can find yourself and you've done this before in an argument or a conflict where you go, what are we arguing about? I can't even remember what this is about, but I just don't like the way you said that or I don't like the way you did this. People start using exclusive terms like never and always, which always leads to conflict. I just used one too. Uh, so for example, and this is a random example, don't blame my wife for what I'm about to say, but your spouse might say to you, you never put the bins out. And you think to yourself, well, I do sometimes, but instead of saying that, you go, I always put the bins out. Now, never and always and neither true, but now you're arguing over never and always and never about the bins and not about the bins. And before you know it, you're having a big old conflict about something that doesn't really matter. You should just probably put the bin out. My point is, is that these neurons in your brain can be a force for good or they can be a force for bad. The Bible says that a gentle answer turns away wrath. That is... Uh, the Bible or science lining, lining up with the Bible because if someone comes in with their emotional angst and their, their frustration, but you actually, instead of mirroring it or increasing it, you flip back and actually give a gentle answer, then what happens is that, that wrath, bit of a Bible word, but you know what I'm saying, that conflict is actually started to switch and dissolved. And before you know it, we can have a conversation about, are you okay? What's going on here? Instead of arguing about how you said it, we can actually talk about what's really going on. Mirror, uh, emotional mirroring. Third one, uh, most common cause of conflict is fighting a fight that's already been won. Quite often when we um, are feeling insecure or we're feeling like a victim or we're feeling undervalued, we can project that feeling onto another person and it's actually got nothing to do with them. And, you know, you probably, maybe you remember this from when you were younger, but my parents used to say when people were mean, my parents used to say, well, it says more about them than it does about you, which is actually true, but really hard to, um, to take on board, especially in the heat of the moment. But it's actually uh, a powerful truth that God has already won the victory. If you're feeling insecure, then get your security from God. If you're feeling undervalued, get your value from God. He's already done the most 
outrageous, breathtaking display of value and uh, and and uh, placing value on you by dying on the cross, by giving his life for you and creating a pathway from you to God, from you to heaven. Therefore, you don't need to project your feeling of insecurity on another person. If someone is doing well, you don't have to you know, pull them down a peg or two because you're feeling insecure, you can actually go, you know what? I'm, I'm confident in who I am and God made me. I know I've got some steps that I need to take to move forward, but I'm not going to get into a conflict situation with a person just because I'm feeling insecure about myself. All right, I'm going to finish with three things and then I've got some questions <clears throat> for you. Three strategies on how to deal with conflict. These you can have for yourself and you can have them up your sleeve for when you're helping leaders of others as well. Um, number one, dealing with conflict is grow up. Maturity is a key um, ingredient in how to deal with conflict. I know it's not very sexy. It's not very like, I don't know, uh, what someone might want to hear. But if there's a conflict and it just won't get resolved, Part of the key might be that we really just need to grow up. We're sulking, we're being a baby, we're being a bit um, childish. And you'd be surprised how many adults still act like children. You'd be surprised if someone filmed you, how you as an adult are sometimes a little bit childish. So before you get into a conflict, if you want to deal with it, let's just say, is anyone being a little bit immature here? Do we just need to grow up? Now, that might be difficult to swallow, but I definitely think it would help. So maturity is one, grow up. Number two is security, man up. Uh, other genders are available, uh, I'm just saying. Um, man up. Sometimes, you know, we just need to get our security from God, which was my um, fight in the fight that's already been one point just now. Um, Numbers 13 tells that incredible story of the 12 spies that went into the promised land and they came back and gave this report and they said, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we, and we seemed the same to them. This idea that the way you view yourself does impact ultimately the way other people view you. Um, and because the 10 spies that came with a negative report viewed themselves insecurely and said, oh, we're just grasshoppers, then it bred a, a culture and ultimately a, um, a reality that other people saw them that way too. Whereas the two spies that gave a good report, they didn't consider themselves grasshoppers. They said, we should, we're, we're warriors. We should surely do this. And so sometimes we just need to man up, get our security from God. And the third thing is look up. It's just get some intimacy with God. If you're trying to deal with conflict, just to make sure your head and heart is in the right place, instead of just assuming you're in the right all the time, get some intimacy with God, get some time with God and say, Holy Spirit, just illuminate to me where I'm being childish, where I'm being insecure, where I'm just trying to prove a point where the, the cost is not worth the prize because God will show you. He knows you better than you know yourself. All right, that's a few points on how to deal with conflict. I've got three discussion questions for you to have and discuss in your leadership life groups. Number one, how do you personally deal with conflict? In other words, what's your default thing to do? Be good to just throw that around amongst the group, just sort of share your different perspectives on how you deal with conflict and how that might have changed. Question number two, what conflict have you experienced in a leadership context that you now know was due to unrealistic or unspoken expectations. Okay, so what conflict have you experienced in a leadership context that was due to unspoken or unrealistic expectations? Just throw that around a little bit and share some of that. I think that'll be good for others to see that they're not the only one that experiences this. And the third and final question is this. If it's okay to disagree, then how can you work with honor and enthusiasm despite this disparity, okay? If it's okay to disagree, which I guess we're saying conflict is inevitable, it's gonna happen. If it's okay then, how do we work and still have honor and enthusiasm at like the full quota despite this tension and disparity between these two opinions?
All of today's content on how to deal with conflict is actually taken from some of the sessions that I've done for Audacious College. I do uh, 10 weeks on how to work with people, okay? Working with people as part of our Audacious College internship and uh, and syllabus. And I would absolutely love if you've enjoyed this content and you think, you know what, I want to hear more about how to work with people, then you can sign up for this session and all of the others by going to audaciouschurch.com forward slash college. And you can find out all about that when, it, when it's coming round and how you can be a part of it. So make sure you do that, Audacious College. And um, yeah, love to see you there. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us on this podcast. I know you're going to have a great discussion in your small groups about it. I hope it helps you in your context and you're able to use it to empower and help others as well. Thanks. Have a wonderful time. See you soon.